Okay, why don't we go ahead and get going. My name is Andrew Wilder. I'm director of the Afghanistan and Pakistan programs here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And on behalf of USIP, we'd like to welcome you all. Um, it's good to see that there's interest in the Pakistan elections. We do quite a few events here on the Afghan elections, and often I think this town was so preoccupied with the Afghan elections. Uh, we just had a very historic election in Pakistan, which didn't get, I think, nearly the attention it deserves. So thank you all for coming. I think we'll have a very a great group of panelists today to discuss uh, analyzing the results um, as we know them today. Um, I mean, from my perspective, um, uh, I did my dissertation on electoral politics back in the 90s, so it's a topic I'm very interested in. Um, uh, lots has changed uh, in this election, um, and I think in particular what was striking to me, the most, probably the most single most encouraging um, thing to me was the turnout. Uh, for in the 90s when I was doing my research, each election we saw turnout go down and down, uh, well below the 40% mark at one point. Um, 2008, we did see that pick up to 44%, but the estimated turnout of approximately 60%, I think, was really remarkable, especially in the light of the electoral violence leading up to the elections, um, the threats of violence, the specific uh, you know, demands by the Taliban that voters not turn out to vote, and the fact that 60% did, I think, was a, a ringing endorsement that democracy is alive and well in Pakistan. So that was encouraging. I also think the fact that we had, um, uh, we've ended up with a fairly decisive result. Um, I think certainly all the pundits that I was listening to, including myself, were predicting a hung parliament and the fact that uh, it looks like Nawaz Sharif will be in a position to form a fairly strong government led by the PMLN, and I, I suspect reaching out to some others. But um, to me, that at least is encouraging. We're, you know, we're not going to end up with, you know, hopefully 100 people in the cabinet to form a government and an ability to actually take some of the tough decisions that Pakistan urgently needs, I think, to address some of these major issues on the economic front, on the security front. Now, whether that happens is another matter, but at least I think that that's a greater possibility now than what I suspected would have been the case um, a week ago. Um, and also, I think, compared to the elections I was looking at, relatively free and fair. Uh, and I know there's lots of allegations now on the social media, and I think there's lots of you know truth to some of them. Um, but relative to some of the past elections, I think the truly independent nature of the Election Commission of Pakistan, the really relatively hands-off policy of the Pakistan military, the active, vibrant role of the media as an overseer of the elections, I think a lot of these things combine to genuinely make this um, uh, uh, a free and fair election, um, certainly by the standards of many of the elections we've seen in Pakistan. Um, but of course, negative developments too. I mean, I think the violence leading up to the polls was very disturbing, violence on election day as well. Um, I think there's a debate now about whether this is the most violent election ever, which is what a lot of the press are reporting. Some people, though, forget 2008 was also a very violent election, uh, which is more, I don't think we have all the statistics yet, but um, certainly the pre-poll violence was disturbing. But what was dis particularly disturbing about it was that in past elections, the violence was more the traditional candidate-based, party-based violence, but this was more of the anti-state elements directly trying to target the elections and influence the result. Um, so again, a slight difference where in the past you had some of the state elements trying to influence the election results. This election, I think, was distinguished more by the anti-state um, elements. Um, and very briefly, another disturbing, I think, development is I think we no longer really have a a national party in Pakistan. I mean, the PPP was the only party that consistently won seats in all four provinces of Pakistan, um, and they've been decimated and sort of reduced to a party of rural Punjab and a uh, rural Sindh and and the Muslim League. You know, of course, won virtually all of its seats practically in the Punjab. And so, some of the parties, of course, did win votes in other provinces, but they didn't win many seats and. And I think that that could be a disturbing trend if it's not reversed, which is why I think it will be important for the Nuashu government to be reaching out to partners and the other parties. But um, I'll leave it at that. Again, and we'll turn it over to our panelists to provide some expert commentary. Um, we're going to start with my colleague, Muid Youssef, who is joining us from Lahore, I hope. Um, are you there, Muid? 
Yep. Can Good. you hear me? Yep, and you're still awake. Um, yeah, so Wade's been a South Asia advisor here at USIP since 2009 and is sort of our resident expert in, pa in Pakistan. Um, we have taught at Boston University and Kaide Azam University and done a lot of consultancy work uh, on issues in South Asia um, and a frequent commentator in the media. He has a, a regular column in Dawn magazine, uh, which I would encourage you all to read. Um, He'll, he'll lead first while we still have a Skype connection, which hopefully lasts and hopefully load shedding doesn't strike in Lahore. Um, uh, next, we have Safiya Ghori um, who has just returned from Pakistan last night, where she was also in Lahore to observe the election. So we hope our panel is interesting enough to keep you awake. Um, um, but thank you for joining us. Um, Safiya is the political team leader at the State Department's Pakistan desk um, and, and is over on the Special Representative for Af on Afghanistan and Pakistan as their lead on Pakistan's internal politics and elections. Uh, Safiya previously worked at State Department's Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and before joining State, worked on religious freedom and tolerance issues in South Asia at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have RF Rafiq. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, RF is an adjunct scholar at the Middle East Institute, uh, where he's conducting research on the reform of national security policy making in Pakistan. Um, I'll be interested to hear his views on whether these elections will have any impact on reforming security policy making in Pakistan. Um, uh, RF is the president of Vizier Consulting, which provides risk analysis on the Middle East and South Asia. Um, and he previously worked at the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. And he's also a regular columnist on media, in the media uh, relating to uh, South Asia and the Middle East. Um, and also has a, he has a regular uh, a, a weekly in, a column in Pakistan's Express Tribune newspaper. Um, so I'll end it there. Um, this is an on-the-record session. Um, if you haven't turned off your cell phones, I'd ask you to do that. And I'll now turn it over to you, Moeed. I'll ask each of our panelists to speak for about 10 minutes, um, 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll hopefully have plenty of time for discussion and question and answers at the end. So, Moeed, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew, and good afternoon. Um, all, it's good to see very many familiar faces there. Um, I'll, I thought what I'll do is basically just give you a broad brush rundown on through the elections and what I saw uh, being on the ground here, and then talk about a few analytical points before um, Safia uh, will, I think, talk more about sort of the impact on the U.S. relationship and uh, what she observed here. Um, so basically, we've got you know the results as they stand. Uh, Pakistan Muslim League, the Nawaz uh, League, has essentially swept the National Assembly given that the predictions were of a hung parliament, they've gotten fairly close to a simple majority. Uh, but the other interesting fact is that you've got different parties coming out ahead in each of the four provinces. Uh, Nawaz League in Punjab, um, the Tariq and Saf Imran Khan's party in, in the uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, uh, the PPP uh, in Sindh, and um, a Pakhtun um, party in Balochistan. But let me first talk a little bit about the elections themselves. Um, and it's interesting that the last month before the elections, it's so almost daily news shows in talk shows in Pakistan saying, well, will the elections be held or not? Um, we're not sure. There's too much violence. Can the state you know, deal with this? And so you know, just the fact that the elections have gone through in some ways is quite an achievement, given the kind of violence that we were seeing before the elections. I would say, though, that you know, I think there's a there's a convenient conflation here between the kind of violence we saw in the run-up to the elections and what we usually call election violence. What we saw is essentially militant violence, and elections were a convenient time and target for the militants to stake a claim on the process and to make their nuisance value felt. Uh, but what the elections essentially showed, or, or the run-up to the elections showed, is that their goal was to derail the political process. They used, you know, they said they're going to go after left of center parties. Ultimately, they also went after right of center parties. There were also intelligence reports that, you know, people like Imran Khan were going to be targeted, etc. 
But I think what, what the state has proven is that it, it has the capacity to stop any major uh, terrorist attacks in urban towns like there were in 2009-10. But it has absolutely no capacity to stop violence at the level that we saw it, which is, you know, targeting a particular candidate, a political office, etc. So I think below a threshold, the state was unable to manage, but, but above that, um, they did fairly well. Also, I think it was heartening to see that the Pakistani elections were fundamentally different because you didn't see the security establishment play the kind of role that it has traditionally and definitely in the 1990s. Um, you know, from what one can tell at this point, they had a fairly hands-off approach. Uh, there was a lot of talk about whether they were going to do something, whether they were involved, whether they were not. But ultimately, it seems that they, they took a hands-off approach, and they were as stumped um, by the results and by Nawaz's sort of uh, victory margin as anybody else was. Um, also, I heard very little about foreign involvement in Pakistani elections. That's another thing for those of you who know Pakistan. Uh, the default conspiracy theory is, oh, the Americans are, are planning and plotting the election results, or the Brits are, and, you know, um, one has to acknowledge that the... Uh, National Reconciliation Ordinance last time, which sort of forgave all the Pakistan People's Party leadership, uh, ultimately turned out to have some foreign uh, support behind it. So I didn't hear much of that at all this time. So in that sense, I think that's a, that's a fairly positive sign that people were focused internally uh, on the elections. There was also the fact that Pakistan, after a long, long time, saw a genuine third force emerge as a contender in the elections. Um, and I think one has to give credit without being partisan here, one has to give credit to Imran Khan and his party for both mobilizing the youth and the women, um, creating the excitement in politics. I mean, I, I have never seen the Pakistani citizenry so excited about elections as I did in the last week um, in the run-up to the elections. Um, and, you know, that is what I really... Um, credit for the 60% or 60-plus percent turnout that we've seen. The people who were at polling stations, one could have never sort of envisioned that segment of Pakistani population, be it sort of the elite youth or women, uh, come out and vote with the kind of energy that they did. So I think all of this in the run-up to the election, uh, to my mind, was fairly heartening. And it's not easily reversible. Once you've mobilized the youth, once you've set up a system where a third force is there, it's not going to be easy to reverse all of this. Um, at will. So, so I think this is there to stay and this is a good sign for uh, Pakistani democracy. As far as the election results are concerned and what they mean, I think I'll make four or five observations, very brief observations on this. First of all, it's a very interesting and puzzling result. You know, the knee-jerk reaction is a lot of people are saying, oh, well, it's the old. Nawaz got all these votes because PPP, and then it's Nawaz, and then it's PPP again. Um, ultimately, I think it was predicted that Nawaz's party was going to win. It's the margin that um, took many by surprise. Uh, at least the last month or so, people were talking about you know, Nawaz winning, but the margin wasn't, wasn't clear. And it wasn't clear because uh, Imran's party was really a wild card. They had no sort of real pattern of gaining votes in past elections. There was no data to go by as to how they would perform, uh, apart from opinion polls, which are very sort of uh, difficult to, to extrapolate to the constituency level in Pakistan's case or any first-past-the-post system. So it was very difficult to, to predict where this was going. Uh, so much so that, you know, even somebody like me, I've been talking about PMLN for the past year and a half saying that they would win. The last 10 days, there was this strange kind of undercurrent, which Imran calls the tsunami, um, which seemed to suggest that something was going to happen. I mean, it was right in the face of everybody in an urban town, um, which made many think that Imran may pull off a, a surprise. But ultimately, I think the results are what, what most expected, barring the, um, the margin of victory. So what do the results tell us about the Pakistani voting pattern? I think, first of all, at the core, the Pakistani voter remains conservative. Um, that's clear with you know, the kind of margin that Nawaz has got. It's the local politics that trumped everything at the end of the day. And if you look at the three parties, the PPP, PMLN, and Imran, Tariq, and Saf, it was Nawaz who had managed to get 
the maximum number of candidates who were electables, who had local constituencies, um, be it patronage or otherwise, who could win an election on their own. And so that little bit of push from Nawaz, Nawaz's party ticket actually got them across the line. So it was very traditional in that sense. Third, I think the incumbency factor was huge. Um, the PPP, ANP getting decimated, um, I would argue that a lot of that had to do with, with their poor governance performance and incumbency. Um, and I think PML ends, Nawaz's genius in terms of his military campaign was that he transferred all the incumbency to the Pakistan People's Party who was ruling in Islamabad. Even though Nawaz was ruling the largest province of Pakistan, Punjab, for the past five years, he somehow managed to convince the populace that the, the entire problem of governance was created by the Pakistan People's Party. Um, fourth, I think the voting pattern also suggests that not all voting was conservative. So Imran swept much of the National Assembly in the KPK, uh, 34 seats in the Provincial Assembly, and has the second highest number of votes um, across Pakistan, which should tell you that actually the tsunami did arrive. It was just exaggerated in what it could have achieved. So, so ultimately, I think he did shake up the system and got uh, new voters and old voters uh, to vote for him. So again, I mean, I think that, that's a positive for Pakistan. And the final trend that I see in terms of the election results um, is that development funds put into constituencies, into regions by governments, do not translate into votes. So the Pakistan People's Party put in bulk of the development funds into uh, Multan, which was Prime Minister Gilani's hometown, and then in Gujar Khan, which was uh, Prime Minister Ashraf's hometown. Both of them got decimated completely. Um, the ANP put in a lot of development funds into uh, their hub constituencies in KPK. They were completely decimated as well. Um, you know, you could draw a, a fairly negative lesson from this, which is that, well, we shouldn't then put in money into development if we're not going to win because of that. I hope that's not the lesson the political parties draw. But it's fairly clear that it didn't help the incumbents uh, as far as um, votes were concerned. Let me quickly uh, talk about so the post-election scenario as well. What does this mean for Pakistan? What does this mean for, um, you know, uh, we in the U.S. looking at Pakistan? First of all, I think the result is fairly good if you're going to give a government a chance of governing well. So Nawaz is going to have a simple majority in, in the National Assembly with some independents joining him. He doesn't need any other rival party to join him, which means that he really has no excuse not to deliver now. He can't point to the PPP or anybody else to say why uh, things are bad. So that's one. You know, there was this fear that the hung parliament would get into all sorts of uh, tough battles between allies who don't like each other, but I don't think that's going to happen in the National Assembly. Second, he will be forced to work with different parties in the provinces. In KPK, he will have to deal with an Imran Khan government more, more than likely, the PPP will form government in Sindh, so Nawaz will have to deal with that. And he'll probably be in coalition in Balochistan as well with one of the nationalist parties. And so, essentially, the system after the 18th Amendment, the devolution of powers to the provinces, forces him to work in alliances at the provincial level, even though he has a very strong mandate at the national level. So I think it really does create a very good mix of allowing him space to make policy changes uh, while having to work with uh, rivals at the provincial level. Ultimately, though, I don't agree with Andrew um, when he says that, you know, 60% out there, this means everybody in Pakistan wants democracy and democracy is thriving. I think Pakistan is wanted to give this a real shot and hope that the next government will be better than the last five years. But if this government doesn't perform, I think you'll see service coming out of Pakistan, which will be as um, pessimistic about the system and the political parties and everything else. Not to say that they're going to support any coup or any military dictatorship or anything, but I think this is a momentary sort of a rise in the popularity of democracy, if you will. And that's been the trend in Pakistan. It's oscillatory. So it all depends on how the next five years are in terms of governance performance by these parties. Uh, if they perform well, I think, yes, Pakistan is a serious chance of 
consolidating democracy. If they can't, then we'll have to wait and see. Um, on, uh, I think the key to watch with the next government will be how Nawaz Sharif manages the military. I'm sure all of you remember that his last uh, tenure was very turbulent when it came to the military and his demise was ultimately brought by a coup. Uh, will he take on the military the way he did last time? Will he try and work with them? Uh, this remains an open question, and quite honestly, nobody really has a good answer to this. Uh, my own sense from just having conversations is that he seems to be a changed man, seems to be a more mature politician. Whether it remains the same when he's in power, we'll have to wait and see. I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but I think the way forward for Pakistan is for the civil and the military limbs to work together. Otherwise, ultimately, you'll run into these turf battles which are not going to let foreign policy develop the way one hopes Pakistan develops it. On foreign policy, I'll just make the last two points, one on foreign policy, one on extremism. On foreign policy, I think it's business as usual. Nothing will change on the U.S. front. Uh, there may be some more nationalistic posturing, but ultimately Nawaz's policy will, I think, be identical to, to the previous government. Nothing will change on the Afghanistan front, I think. Uh, it's business as usual. What may change is Nawaz's appetite for peace with India. And that's huge. I mean, that's not, not trivial when it comes to Pakistan's foreign policy. Uh, again, he will have to carry the military with him. How well he does that, we'll have to wait and see. But his heart is very much invested in a better Pakistan-India relationship. And I think there's nothing more important for South Asia than a, a normalized Pakistan-India equation. It's going to be very difficult. India has a very, very weak government. They have elections next year. I don't see anything moving very quickly. But I think the directionality on India, as far as Pakistan is concerned, is going to be positive. And the other positive here is that all political parties seem to be on the same page when it comes to improving ties with India. Finally, on extremism. This is a toss-up. I mean, Nawaz in, in Punjab for the past five years was fairly disappointing. Um, you know, the, the Punjab government kept signaling to, to Islamabad and to the military saying, well, this is not our problem, they have to fix it. In reality, they could have done things which they didn't. Uh, there's also this question mark on electoral alliances with, with certain uh, ultra-right parties. Um, if Nawaz has to improve ties with India, he has to deal with the southern Punjab problem in terms of extremism. Um, Imran is going to be in KPK. Nawaz and Imran have talked about uh, talking to the Pakistani Taliban, and Imran has a very clear stance on um, the war on terror being America's war and shooting down drones, etc. So this is one area where I think the jury is still out. I think Nawaz understands the repercussions of taking too hawkish a stance. So he may again be business as usual with some long-term socioeconomic de-radicalization, mean, mainstreaming kind of policies uh, in terms of extremism in southern Punjab. I don't see a major sort of you know, law enforcement, military kind of operation in that area. I think the capacity is not there, and perhaps uh, the will is, will is also wanting. But we have to keep our eyes on this, because we just don't know how the PMLN PTI equation will work in terms of the KPK and Nawaz's government um, in Punjab. I don't see any major uh, decisive actions uh, coming anytime soon, though. That, that I'm pretty clear about. So overall, I think, I, I think the elections have been a positive. I, I won't talk about rigging but, uh, because I think Safia will, will cover it. But overall, I think it's been good news for Pakistani democracy. Um, they've had elections. The run-up was violent, but they, they managed it. The results, I think, are fairly positive, ultimately, if you had to give a party a mandate. Um, and I think Pakistan, the energy that I'm seeing in this country about elections and post-elections and the youth, uh, it's just fantastic to watch. I don't remember this in my lifetime. Uh, I wasn't around in the 70s. Maybe Andrew can tell us more about that. Let me stop here. <laughs> the advantage you have of being in Lahore is I can't pass you a note saying you've exceeded your time, Weed. But uh, <laughs> and I was just trying to be a little hopeful on Pakistan's future, and you shot me down on that. So anyway, but um, uh, Sophia, over to you. Thank you. Um, so like Andrew said, I just returned from Pakistan last night. Um, I was a uh, part of the U.S. Embassy's election observation team in Lahore, and so I was able to spend um, a few days out in Lahore, which was fascinating. Um, and I was able to visit about um, 25 polling stations in Lahore um, 
both in Nawaz Sharif's constituency and in his nephew Hamza Shabazz Sharif's constituency. And I, I, I sort of wanted to give a little bit of the flavor of what I saw and, and conversations that took place while I was out there. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of first start from on the ground observations and then shift a little bit to what, you know, what it means for U.S.-Pakistan relations. Um, you know, before we even reached Pakistan, uh, we were on a flight from Dubai to Lahore, and we could sort of feel the election fervor on the flight. It seemed like the entire flight was um, wearing Imran Khan t-shirts, chanting, singing, um, and the excitement level was, was something that, I, you know, I did not expect. And, and um, many of those who were traveling back from the Gulf or um, even the U.S. and the U.K. To, to vote for Imran Khan, and I was, we were seated next to a gentleman from Chicago who was traveling back to vote for Pakistan and he, to vote for Imran Khan and said, this is Pakistan's moment and we want to be a part of it and we want to support um, Imran. Uh, and so that was a really sort of interesting insight traveling back was this diaspora support for, for Imran and the fervor for the elections. Um, once we were, you know, in, in Lahore, I was there um, for a few days and I was observing elections on, on the election day throughout the entire day. And, um, you know, I think overall, in Lahore, and I'm caveating this in Lahore because I know the situation is different in, and was different in Karachi and also in, in some constituencies in Lahore. Um, but what I observed and what many of my colleagues in Lahore and uh, in Islamabad observed was that things ran smoothly procedurally um, and were largely sort of, um, uh, you know, there was a, a procedure in place that seemed to me that was very impressive. Um, you know, I think in Punjab and in, in Karachi, Balochistan, there was incidents of violence on election election day and there were concerns for, for international observers on election day, but um, I thought I'd sort of go through um, some of the positive things that I saw. Um, first is uh, the organization of the election commission. Um, I was very impressed with the way that um, the voter registration lists came out, the fact that many people um, felt like their, you know, their names were there, the, their card numbers matched the, ballot, um, the, the voter list, they were given ballots, um, there was enough ballots, um, officers were trained properly, things really seemed to, to run smoothly uh, in large part. Um, the other interesting factor was that every party had a, a party polling agent present in the in the um, polling station, and so they were sort of lined up. They were watching very closely. They had their own voter lists there, um, and so that was that was interesting. They were there when the boxes were locked, so they were able to observe that the boxes um, were empty, and then they were there when they were locked. They were there when they were unlocked at the end of the day, and they were there for the counting of the ballots. Um, you know, the ECP had mandated that there be a 400-foot perimeter around um, uh, the polling station, and this was large, in large part followed through on, um, you know, there were many signs in Urdu to explain the process to people, which line to stand in, where to go, where do you vote. Um, and, you know, we were there to observe the counting process, and the counting process was very rigorous with, um, you know, they would sort of dump out all the, the paper ballots, unfold everything, stack them based on the party, and then count. And several people would count over and over and over again. Um, and so this took several hours, but it was an interesting observation for us to see that all the party um, uh, agents were there and that the process was sort of running in this way. Um, the other, the second, the second thing that I noticed was the strength of the um, local police and the military. Um, and this was, this was told to me by several people is that they were very impressed with the way that the police officers were helping them, directing them to the polling stations. Um, and, you know, I visited, uh, whether it's good or bad, I visited some, some, some of the sensitive polling stations where the military was present. Um, and things seemed to be running a little bit more smoothly in those, um, in those polling stations. But um, you know, I think many people were very impressed with the strength and the support of the local police uh, and the military. Um, like Andrew and Moeed said, um, you know, they talked about the voter turnout. You know, just in terms of optics, Lahore was about 108 degrees the day that we were observing elections. Um, people stood in line for hours, um, and many of those lines were moving very, very slowly. And people were there in the heat. They were there in long lines. It was young people coming out to vote. Um, and I, you know, I kind of, um, 
snuck into both the men's voted, uh, polling stations and, and I was in the women's polling stations too. Um, but the women's lines were just as long as the men's lines um, to vote, which is, which, you know, after talking to people was something that they had not seen before. Um, young women coming out to vote, women bringing their children, explaining to them the, the sort of democratic process, um, which was really um, impressive. And when I asked about numbers, you know, everywhere I went, I sort of asked what was the number of registered voters and what was, you know, how many people had voted throughout the day. And, you know, around eight or nine o'clock, it was eight, nine people. But by noon, they were seeing such an increase in numbers and the lines had just doubled by noon. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I met a man who was in Lahore who uh, was probably in his 60s and he uh, was telling us that this was the first time he had ever voted and he was voting for the first time and he was proud to be a part of the process. So everything I heard from talking to people um, who were voting and from polling officials made it seem like there was this pride in the, in the process. Um, so, you know, there was quite a bit of excitement about the elections and there was um, um, a sort of belief in the process, which I think um, was very heartening. Uh, I met a man who was, stood in line for two hours and um, was turned away from uh, a polling station because he didn't have proper ID. Um, and his, he had brought a photocopy of his ID card rather than his actual ID card. And in, a, in the proper manner, the, the, the um, ECP officials told the man that, you know, very sorry, but this is not the proper ID. You'll have to come back with the proper ID. Um, and he was very upset, very upset. He came to us and said, and this was very moving to me as he said, um, you know, that's fine for me. I'll turn back around and not cast my vote. But how will I change my situation in life? And this was really indicative to me because one, I thought, you know, that there's this sense that you're becoming a part of the process, doing your civic duty could change your, you know, your situation. I think a large part of that was Imran Khan's, um, you know, a lot of, uh, of the talk and a lot of what people were hearing in the lead up to the elections. Um, there was also, just in terms of atmospherics, there was a lot of, um, of voters either wearing the, um, the sort of lion Punjab share t-shirts or pins, and then Imran Khan's had his face on a lot of the t-shirts or um, you know the cricket bat. And so there was a lot of people who were just very excited to be there, excited to be a part of the process. Um, and we were in, you know, just sort of, um, People talk about Imran's, you know, there was a lot of disappointment after the results came in from Imran's supporters, but from what I saw was that, you know, in Nawaz's constituency, where he has a stronghold, um, the PTI candidate did fairly well. And the PTI candidate was sort of an unknown quantity, you know, not, not too many people knew, um, you know, uh, these candidates, the PTI candidates, and they were still doing pretty well in a, in a very PMLN uh, strong, con strongly held constituency. So, you know, I think that's an indicator for the fact that, you know, while they may not have won as many seats as they would have liked to, I think um, there was a lot of support, at least from what I was seeing. Um, you know, the second thing that I, that I saw was, um, despite the threats and despite the sort of security, there was army, there was local police, um, you know, it, voting occurred in many areas, including the KP, including Balochistan, including the Fatah. And so we, were, we did see that people came out to, to vote despite the threats that we were seeing. Um, you know, I saw a police officer, I was talking to a police officer who was at a station who, um, who, who told me very proudly that Pakistan is entering a new era and that people feel their civic duty um, to come vote and we are here to protect them. So, you know, I did feel everywhere I went that there was this sort of spirit um, uh, toward, you know, towards working together towards um, a democratic process. Um, one thing that I did notice on the, in the women's polling stations um, was that there was, uh, there was a lot of support for each other. You know, they're standing in long lines, they're sharing their water, they're sharing their, you know, they're sharing their lunch, they're there to support each other, they're making sure no one gets out of the lines. Um, explaining to those who couldn't read the Urdu signs where you need to go, what you need to do. So there was a lot of sort of, um, you know, uh, excitement about the process which was felt throughout the day, um, even at the very end of the day. So um, I'll just, so, there's, so those were sort of my positive 
um, you know, experiences in, throughout the day. But of course, you know, there was, there was violence in Karachi, there was violence in Balochistan, there was quite a bit of violence in the lead up to the election. Um, and, you know, like Andrew said, we're still sort of looking at the numbers and assessing, and, and people have said it was the, the bloodiest election. Um, you know, we did see localized violence, so I, um, you know, I was, turned away from several polling stations because there were fights breaking out. People were standing in the heat. People were getting tired. Um, PTI, PMLN supporters would get into a brawl and would, you know, um, start uh, tossing punches. And so those were sort of the localized violence that we saw. But, um, but every, uh, other than that, I think um, broadly, you know, we, we didn't experience any of that in Lahore where I was at. Um, again, the allegations of, of vote rigging, um, there were reports of, of vote rigging and election irregularities in Karachi and in pockets of Lahore. Um, I know the ECP is, is ordering re-polling in some of these polling stations. Um, you know, polling staff, there was reports that polling staff were threatened, polling stations opened late, um, people were turned away. And one of the instances in, in where I was at, um, so the the polling stations were supposed to close at five, but they actually extended the, the hours until six. So, um, you know, we had been informed of this through, through the embassy, and um, we um, showed up at a polling station, and the doors had already been shut, and um, the officials, polling officials, had started counting, and it was five, and they didn't realize that that uh, the hours had been extended. And so there was a lot of writing and protesting and PTI supporters and PMLN supporters were very upset and they, they, they asked us to sort of go inside. And we spoke to the official and he didn't, he wasn't aware that it had been ex extended. And so he had to lock the box back up in front of everybody and then open the doors back up. So I think there was some confusion um, in certain pockets. Um, I think our assessment uh, of the election is largely in line with the EU and NDI's assessment, which is one, the elections highlighted Pakistan's commitment to a strong uh, democratic process by candidates, voters, and political parties. Uh, two, that the pre-election violence did distort the playing field in certain areas where people couldn't go out and campaign. And three, that significant improvements um, had been made, but there were these procedural issues that need to be addressed. Um, so I'll turn quickly, since I, I got my three-minute note, that uh, I'll turn quickly to us Pakistan relations. Um, I think Nawaz has set, uh, has quickly set a positive tone for um, on foreign policy and has called, you know, uh, publicly called on strengthening U.S. Pakistan ties. Um, our Secretary Kerry spoke with him on Sunday, um, and I, I think there's a commitment to work through tough issues, um, you know, both on both sides, which is very important. Another really positive gesture that um, Nawaz did very early on is, is look at strengthening regional ties. Um, like Moeed said, he's reached out to, to Prime Minister Singh. I think there's been invitations for a visit on both sides. He's also um, been in touch with with President Karzai and, and has stated the need for Pakistan's uh, really, you know, good relations with Afghanistan. So these are all sort of positive, um, positive things that have come out in the recent days. And I, you know, I think um, we've touched on this a little bit, but I think the strong parliamentary representation ensures that there's a stronger, uh, stronger government. And I think a lot of what we were hearing beforehand was that there's going to be a fractious coalition difficult to get things, to move things forward on a domestic agenda. And I think, um, you know, Nawaz's mandate uh, gives us less concern that, you know, a government could collapse on a vote, for, vote of no confidence or, or on those sorts of lines. So I'll leave it at that and then we can have more at the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I, uh, like Safia, I was uh, observing the elections, but I was observing them from my home in Virginia. So it wasn't <laughs> quite, I don't have any uh, rich anecdotes, but I, I thought those were really powerful and they um, uh, sort of jived with what I saw on television. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to do is uh, deal with the big picture first and then make some comments about uh, the campaign season, the campaign process, then election day, the election results, and then uh, sort of talk about the net impact. Uh, these elections are, uh, you know, a pivotal step forward in terms of consolidating democracy inside Pakistan. Uh, you know, they take place in the backdrop of a year of change. Uh, we're going to have a new army chief, uh, most likely by the end of the year, a new chief justice, and possibly even a new president. Um, and, you know, these players that have been around for the past five years have largely, though there has been uh, uh, quite a bit of discord among them, 
Uh, we've seen, you know, the memo gate issue, uh, the, the, uh, the tensions between the Supreme Court Chief Justice and President Zardari. There are red lines in ter that have been emerging in terms of how Pakistan's elite deals with one another. And I think this has been a big challenge throughout its history, uh, to develop this kind of elite consensus about the rules of the game. Um, you know, it's quite messy. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's its own unique type of version of uh, <coughs> Pakistani democracy. But there are some outlines, some red lines that exist. And, you know, if we look at, for example, uh, with the events that happened in January, the sit-in that was uh, conducted by Tahrir al-Qadri, you had support from the Chief Justice and the Army Chief for the democratic process. Uh, on April 30th, General Kayani gave his Martyr's Day address, and he said that these elections were a golden opportunity for Pakistan to address uh, these illnesses that it faces, including terrorism. So there's a will in terms of the uh, current political leadership or the power elite in Pakistan uh, for uh, the, the democracy train to move forward. But, you know, everything's very tentative. Uh, we don't, uh, General Kayani and uh, Nawaz Sharif don't have, um, you know, those, uh, that time of, uh, have not had an opportunity to build a relationship as, let's say, uh, President Zardari and General Kayani have. You know, despite their tensions, you know, the tensions between President Zardari and uh, General Kayani, they have used uh, the Troika, which is a sort of informal uh, type of uh, meeting between the President, the Prime Minister, and the Army Chief to uh, develop consensus on national security issues. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is somebody who has, um, um, even more than uh, some Pakistan center-left parties, emphasized, uh, emphasized the need for um, uh, civilian control over national security policy making. And so, you know, he might um, be reluctant to use informal methods, but uh, on, the on the positive side, he could uh, try to strengthen more institutional methods for developing consensus, such as uh, the Defense Committee of the Cabinet. So, you know, in terms of this consensus, it doesn't just include the major political parties, uh, the, ar the current army leadership, the judiciary, and uh, the general public. It also includes the media. And, um, you know, what we saw was, uh, you know, highly competitive elections uh, combined with a high level of pu public enthusiasm. And, um, you know, Pakistan's dozen plus cable news channels, and these are news channels, not entertainment channels. These are entities, uh, for-profit entities, that have a vested interest in terms of covering politics and news. And so that means there's a real demand for watching all this. So these channels help contribute to, to the sort of pre-election frenzy. Uh, so there were channels like uh, Geo News that had uh, public service announcements before the elections telling people to vote, <laughs> that it's a national duty, vote for Pakistan. Um, there were even um, mobile phone service a mobile phone service provider by the name of Dejuice, which targets targets young people uh, that provided a special app or something like that that uh, in which uh, young people could track the elections, find their local polling station, and things like that. So you know these were um, uh, and then it, there were even uh, television commercials that were for laundry detergent and food that during the election season incorporated election terminology in, in, their, in their commercials. So they use the word intikhab to, to elect. Uh, so, you know, choose this uh, laundry detergent. So, you know, these were aspects of how um, politics and electoralism or appreciation for the elections intruded or entered into everyday life. So I think, you know, uh, it sort of is, a, you know, these kind of, it's, it's sort of an awkward or, or unusual uh, anecdote that, um, demonstrates the high level of enthusiasm for the electoral process. As to whether that will be sustained, you know, as Moeed had said and indicated, Pakistanis are giving uh, this, the system a chance. Uh, and, you know, in some ways it could be the last chance for democracy, but then in other ways, you know, we do see that there is that a democratic alternative uh, to the two parties that has emerged, and that is Imran Khan's Pakistan Tehreek Insaf. So as much as um, you know, his party has railed against uh, the status quo. In many ways, it could be a, a civilian force that preserves or adds continuity to the democratic process. Because if people are fed up with Nawaz Sharif, or you know, after let's say up to five years, uh, if he doesn't um, meet their expectations, uh, the center right and especially Pakistanis who traditionally have supported military intervention have an alternative in the form of uh, Imran Khan's party. 
So, you know, we even saw a, a maturation of uh, political advertising in Pakistan, and um, Imran Khan's party is re uh, really took the lead in this and was very inventive. Uh, one of its, his supporters is a, uh, a man who comes in a lot of uh, TV commercials in Pakistan, so he, he's sort of um, made a lot of these advertisements. Then we saw Nawaz Sharif's party respond and um, have more professional advertisements, and then there were even uh, very clever attack ads uh, that were uh, made by Pakistan, the Pakistan People's Party. And all this happened within a short period of time. So uh, it, it, it was an indicator of uh, not just the competitiveness uh, of the elections, but also the salience of uh, cable news and new media. So uh, though Pakistan is still a majority rural country, I think what we are seeing is uh, you know, the final emergence, uh, the emergence of urban politics. And Pakistan is at a transition point demographically. And we're, we're seeing that uh, new media television has an impact beyond uh, the urban areas and is entering you know, peri-urban areas and possibly even, even rural areas. Uh, in respect to the polls, there were, uh, you know, it was, uh, we're all quite aware of uh, the high levels of participation. The Election Commission estimates that turnout was about uh, 60%, um, and you know, uh, turnout was especially high in, in urban areas. Uh, and um, you know, though there were efforts to block the participation of women in, in Lower Deer, for example, um, all, the, all the major political parties agreed to prevent women from uh, turning out to vote. Um, we also saw that in, in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province and in Fatah, there were more um, uh, female candidates that took part in the polls uh, than ever. Um, and, and lines in Peshawar and elsewhere. Um, in fact, there were some anecdotes that I had read in, in social media and in some of the cable news uh, channels that uh, the female lines were much longer than the male lines. And, you know, some had, uh, had said, um, that it might be because um, you know the women polling uh, authorities were more inefficient, but I think that's a bit uh, you know it's not uh, charitable. It might be a reflection of gender bias, but um, in any event, uh, what we see is that um, you know there is greater participation um, from women uh, in the political process, and that's a, you know a big a net positive from these uh, elections. Uh, just anecdotally, you know there weren't I don't I haven't seen any exit polls that were conducted will probably be released in the, in the next few months. But um, what I did notice was that in Punjab and, and parts of Karachi, there were actually split family voting. And so what we saw is that uh, in, in some families, the younger people and women voted for Imran Khan's party, and then the elder, uh, the men tended to vote for Nawaz Sharif's party. So, you know, it's an indication of how Imran Khan's uh, successful outreach to, uh, to the youth and to women, and also uh, the fact that women are exerting greater agency uh, in terms of the political process. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Balochistan or rural Balochistan was the outlier in, in, in this election process. It's a combination of two factors. One, in the overall insurgency and, and uh, the dissatisfaction of uh, much of the population with, with the center, uh, and also uh, the role that uh, insurgent groups have been playing in the process. If you follow, I follow much of their, um, I track much of their, you know, their public statements, and many of them were gloating about uh, attacks uh, that they conducted on uh, individuals that were connected to the election process. Uh, there are also claims that there were irregularities in terms of uh, how uh, the, the vote count and, and, um, and sort of the post-election scenario in Balochistan, and you know that's possibly uh, a mechanism by um, you know the military to sideline some nationalist politicians in, in Balochistan, and you know that's unfortunate because these elections uh, <coughs> ideally would have provided an opportunity for the government of Pakistan to include um, many Baloch nationalist politicians into the political fold. So um, you know at first glance the election results. Uh, might point towards uh, uh, some sort of polarization in the country. That Nawaz Sharif's party, 94% of its uh, National Assembly seats were won in Punjab. Uh, for the PPP, all but one of its National Assembly seats were from Sindh. And you know, that could be an indication that um, Pakistan is being divided or is uh, sort of polarizing on, on the basis of ethnicity and even uh, you know, political factions. But uh, I think there's another way to look at this. Um, alternatively, we could, we could sort of see it as uh, the splintering of the center right. And you know, we have the center right uh, being split in the form of uh, PTI and PMLN. 
And then even in the form of these different Islamist parties. So in the 2002 elections, they cooperated in the form of the Mutahada Majlis Yamal, a, a religious, uh, pan-religious alliance. Uh, this time around, uh, there wasn't any seat adjustment that was conducted uh, by the religious parties. They all pretty much went on their own. Uh, in fact, uh, Fazl Rahman's uh, JUIF party uh, uh, did seat local seat adjustments with uh, the Qaumi Watan party, which is uh, Aftab Sherpao's party, which is basically um, uh, sort of an attempt to have a, a new form of uh, quasi Pashtun nationalism. I'm not sure how to describe it because it was kind of just invented last year. But um, uh, but he's leveraging his own family background and and uh, sort of the the, the the void within the Pashtun nationalist realm um, for his own political gain. Uh, in any event, um, uh, you know, so there is this uh, you know the 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 challenge of polarization that. Um, may or may not exist, but in terms of uh, just in terms of the political parties themselves, um, I am a bit apprehensive about uh, the impact in Karachi, uh, because what we have is the MQM um, in feeling that it is being sidelined or that it doesn't have a good options, um, and you know the MQM is not needed to form a coalition government at the center. Uh, and, and it's not needed to form a coalition in Sindh. Uh, the PMLN and the PPP are safe in those respective areas. Um, the, there haven't been local government elections conducted since, um, or there hasn't been a local government since 2010. This is basically a bread and butter issue for, for the MQM. The MQM has strongly militant tendencies and uh, it negotiates using violence. Karachi, since 2008, has been uh, a scene of uh, multiple battles that have been going on, uh, and it started with a fight between the MQM and the MQMH, then it became an MQM fight with uh, the ANP and Pashtuns. Now the Taliban have activated their physical presence there, and um, you know we don't have a track record of the MQM and the PMLN dealing well with one another. Um, that sort of, you know, if you want to put it in more crude terms, the, the, the tensions between you know, Muhajirs or Urdu-speaking people and Punjabis um, at least as it's manifested within electoral politics, uh, is, is quite high. And they don't have a record, a track record of talking to one another. So I do have three minutes, so I have to kind of get through a lot of things quickly, but um, um, I think for Nawaz Sharif, the challenge is to um, you know, not be overwhelmed by his strong electoral showing. Um, you know, he, got, he performed better than expected and has a near majority. Uh, in previous times, uh, in his pre two previous instances in power, uh, he felt a bit emboldened and uh, challenged the military. In some ways, he was right, but uh, you know he was uh, quite assertive uh, with the military and the judiciary, and also with uh, some of uh, Pakistan's political parties that uh, are operate in the periphery. Uh, he will have to learn how to deal with the MQM, um, and for you know the PPP, that is kind of proven uh, mission impossible. So. I'm not quite sure that uh, anybody can really give him solid advice on that. But at the same time, he will have to uh, deal with, he, he doesn't have the luxury of not really uh, having a responsibility in respect to countering terrorism. Um, one could do that from Punjab. One can do that if one was not even in the National Assembly. Now he's prime minister of the entire Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Uh, so he will have to deal with uh, a government in the KP province that uh, is a pretty uh, hard line in terms of its opposition to military operations. And then he'll have to deal with a military that is pretty focused on uh, combating the TTP. Not other insurgent groups but, or terrorist groups, but the TTP itself. So, um, you know, he's going to have to develop um, uh, institutions that will allow him to develop consensus with the military and he'll have to develop some courage uh, in order to speak out against militancy in a public fashion and not equivocate. And um, he will have to somehow manage uh, Imran Khan's party, which uh, is, uh, will be governing the front line in, the war on, in Pakistan's war on terror. Um, so I don't have any, I'm not optimistic about those factors. I am fairly optimistic about his uh, intent and capacity to deal with a lot of the uh, um, economic and governance related challenges. Uh, the cabinet he will set up will most likely be far superior to the one that preceded it. 
Um, and what they are looking to do is um, increase the tax net, increase Pakistan's self-reliance, boost trade, and I think the, it, it sort of jives with the appetite here, or the declining appetite here and elsewhere for not giving a Pakistan free handout. So what we have is a government that is willing to uh, shape up um, in, in many respects, and an international community that uh, is looking for somebody in Pakistan to do that. So, um, you know, on the terrorism front, I think it's going to be very murky, and I'm not that optimistic, but I think on the economic front, which, uh, intera which is directly related, has, you know, strong <coughs> relations with the issue of, of, of terrorism, I am still uh, pretty optimistic. Uh, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I forgot to mention one of the historic things about these elections for me was it forced me to actually get onto Twitter. Um, uh, but interesting, in 2008, I was observing the elections, and again, the impact of the electronic media was phenomenal in contrast, again, when I was looking at elections more closely in the 90s. But I think the interesting thing of 2013 was uh, the impact of social media. And again, we don't know what it was, but it, uh, I think an interesting thing to look at. It's one of the things at USIP we were interested in and supported some initiatives. And um, Bites for All had the pack votes hashtag, which uh, what I got a lot of my information from on, uh, on election day, um, which went sort of viral and was one of the top you know, sites. Um, uh, but again, that was a first for me. So, uh, but I think it will be interesting now to reflect on what role that played also in this post-election phase in terms of a lot of the potential delegitimizing impact um, in terms of a lot of the uh, um, you know, accusations of fraud and, and violations, which are now, I think, day one we heard about Karachi, you know, then Baluch low in Baluchistan, now a bit more in Lahore, and that, that, is, is that going to trend, I think remains to be seen. Um, just one last comment, then we'll open up to questions, but I think we would mentioned the 18th Amendment, and what, one other, I think, potential impact of this election for me is that we talked about the ter in terms of now the powers of the provincial government and how Nawaz Sharif at the center is going to have to deal more with them, but I also think um, the 18th Amendment was also intended to return Pakistan to a parliamentary form of government, and this was done in 2010. Um, but President Zardari, um, I think many people would feel, retain quite a bit of the decision-making authority in the presidency. Um, and I think we actually now would potentially see Pakistan, in terms of civilian power, very much now go back to the prime minister. Um, and I think that could be, we might actually have a, a truly parliamentary form of government for the first time in quite a while in Pakistan. So anyway, let's open it up any for questions and comments, starting right here in the front row. If you could first identify yourself, and we'll get, bring you a microphone. Um, and if you can keep your questions relatively short in comments so that we have time for as many as possible. Uh, my name is uh, Arnold Zeitlin, and I opened up the first Associated Press Bureau in Pakistan in 1969. So I was there in the 70s. You can answer Moeed's questions. Then. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I had the pleasure of covering the 1970 election, which is probably still the fairest election ever held in Pakistan. Uh, the quick questions I have is, if Imran, Imran, Imran Khan uh, was such a force in stimulating the uh, participation of voters, why didn't his party do better? And two, uh, have the Pakistan voters once again rejected religious parties? And three, uh, is Nawaz, or does Nawaz have the vision, uh, the will, and the intelligence to really make change in Pakistan? Two or three more questions and go back to the panel for answers. Um, back here. My name is Malik Sirajakur. I'm a Pakistani journalist. I edit the online newspaper, the Baloch Hal. Two quick questions, uh, or maybe developments that took place in Pakistan on the eve of the elections. Our wonderful friend, Declan Walsh, who is the correspondent of the New York Times, who was expelled from Pakistan on the eve of the elections. And yesterday, there was this article in The Guardian by Mohammed Anif where he said it was probably the military that kicked Declan Walsh out of the country rather than the civilian government. 
none of the political parties reacted. And my concern is about press freedom, since I also am a journalist myself. Pakistan voted on a day when YouTube was consistently banned for the seventh consecutive month. So what is going to ha happen to the state of the media in Pakistan, particularly to the Western media? And secondly, days before, uh, two weeks before the election, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom issued a report uh, describing Pakistan as one of the most insecure countries for religious minorities. And Imran Khan was out there in public speaking against the Ahmadi religious minority in Pakistan. So, Safiya, since you have worked with the uh, minority issues, could you kindly talk about you know uh, the Pakistan religious minorities and what is going to happen to the Ahmadis, the way we saw the misuse of the blasphemy law during the People's Party government. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, I'm Colin Cochran at SICE. Um, I was wondering if any of you could speak a little bit more, um, looking at, you, you sort of touched on this, but going forward, um, the PTI, given that they do not seem to sort of met their uh, expectations for particularly performance in Punjab. I'm wondering uh, if if we can expect the party to sort of reconsolidate in Khyber Pakhtunwa, where they may be able to actually form a government, or um, looking longer term for how these new voters or, or newly mobilized parts of urban Pakistan, um, what you maybe see their participation in politics looking like uh, after this election. Thanks. Muid, why don't we go back to you to start off? Uh, if you want to take any of those questions, then. Are you still with us, Muid? <laughs> um, Safia, do you want to take? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he's dealing with load shedding or. Um, um, so I'll, I'll first talk about. Um, the user of question on religious minorities, and I know that um, we've continued to raise the issue of the protection of religious minorities um, and the issue of voting rights for all minorities with the government of Pakistan consistently uh, in the lead up to the election. Um, it, it, it was very unfortunate that Imran Khan came out with a statement against uh, Ahmadis a few days before the election. I mean, he has previously, and other parties had previously, um, Taken some, some, and had publicly stated proactively that you know we support the rights of minorities to come out and vote, and we want them to be a part of the electoral process. The ECP had trained their um, officials to sort of look out for issues related to discrimination at the polls. So I know that this issue was uh, was uh, sort of being looked at, and and it's something that that um, we've raised consistently with the government on the inclusion and protection of religious minorities in Pakistan. It is a concern, um, you know, I, and I do think that it is unfortunate that the Ahmadi community, um, you know, was sidelined in a way because they weren't able to vote based on the, um, based on the, the issue that they have with their identity cards and being unable to get identity cards. Um, so it is a concern and it's something we regularly raise. Um, on Declan Walsh, um, in sort of the broader issue of press freedom, I know RF touched on it a little bit, is um, the press was, was very much um, present. They were very much, you know, covering um, uh, outside of polling stations, asking questions, taking photographs, um, and they were very involved in the process. They were sort of feeding the information, the sort of uh, breaking news at six o'clock, what polling agents were saying, and so they're very involved. On Declan, I, th I do think it's unfortunate that, um, that he uh, had to leave uh, Pakistan, and it's something that, that we had worked on, um, you know, to ensure that he was able to, to sort of stay according to the rules and regulations, so it's something that, that is concerning. Um, on why didn't PTI do better, and sort of looking at um, Nawaz's vision for change, you know, I think PTI, like I said, in, in the constituencies that I observed, um, Imran Khan uh, and his, his candidates in those parties, which were Nawaz strongholds, did do um, pretty good. They weren't able to, to sort of win those constituencies, but they did make a dent. Um, and I do think, you know, after the elections, talking to very disappointed PTI supporters the next day, people were still hopeful. They said, now Imran Khan is in, he's got 30 seats. Um, let's see how things will change in the next five years. So there was a sense of hopefulness about the fact that he could come back. This was just a step. This was a stepping stone for him. Um, uh, so that's sort of um, looking at, at, from my perspective, on, on PTI. PTI's vote, voter base was also very much in um, 
the urban areas. It was a, among a certain class, and I do think that there was women who are coming out in support of him. There's young people who are coming out in support of him, but um, I, I don't think that translated to rural parts of Punjab. I don't think that translated among certain demographics. Um, I, I don't remember if it was our for Andrew who mentioned that ho that that people's homes were totally split. The young people were all, you know, in support of, of Imran and PTI, and there were certain loyalties that people felt towards Nawaz or the sort of, uh, the traditional parties um, that I think was reflected in the polls. Um, and finally, on, on do we think Nawaz's vision um, will actually make change? I think that, um, Nawaz's domestic vision on economic issues, on load shedding, on energy, I think there is there is an effort. I think his team understands the, the situation that they're in. And I do think that there is an effort, at least we've seen from their part, that, that they plan to address this issue very quickly. And that I think that's promising. And those are the issues, those are the bread and butter issues that Pakistanis voted on. They voted on domestic issues, energy, um, uh, the economy. One thing I heard someone over, you know, I, I heard someone um, say at the polls was, you know, we're voting for Nawaz because he's revolutionized my life with this metro bus. He's created this metro bus in Punjab, which has eliminated his commute time from two hours to 30 minutes. So there's actual real sort of issues that people were f felt that they were voting because he's helped, you know, we're holding him accountable, he's helped us in certain ways. So um, I hope that, that answers some of the questions. Uh, in respect to the Amity issue, uh, Safiya had said, uh, you know, talked about the, the pledges that Pakistani political parties and, and um, leaders in government make in respect to uh, religious uh, freedom and all that. Amities are kind of the outlier uh, in respect to those pledges, so, um, you know, and um, even religious scholars who are, you know, Sunni and Shia um, tend to, you know, talk about, um, you know, the defense of uh, religious minorities uh, who are Christian and Hindu and others. Uh, the Amity situation is a bit more complicated because um, uh, the sort of consensus view among mainline Muslims is that uh, they violate the, um, the finality of the prophethood, which is an essential part of Islam. And so, you know, it has kind of led to a, uh, an industry for targeting Amadis. And so there's the Khatami Nubuat Foundation, the uh, Finality of the Prophethood Foundation. And it's just a very difficult issue uh, politically um, in the same way that, uh, you know, it's a crude comparison, but in the same way that, for example, President Obama had to distance himself from any sort of Muslimness uh, in the 2008 campaign. Imran Khan was kind of forced to do the same um, with Amadis. He's actually been, um, in some of his campaign materials, some of the videos and, and other things that they've produced, uh, they have images of um, uh, um, the Pakistan uh, Nobel Laureate, who's an Amadi, of, um, of the, I forgot, the Salam. of the Salam, yes. So, um, you know, so that was an indication of its embrace of all of Pakistan. But what happened was uh, Maulana Fazl Rahman's party and possibly even some other political parties um, uh, started saying that uh, he would issue legislation declaring them uh, to be Muslim, and uh, because of, according to the Constitution of Pakistan, they're not. Um, and so then he had to go on the defensive. Uh, and this was done in the last two weeks of the campaign. And then so he had to issue a video stating, you know, sort of um, uh, defending his anti Ahmadi bona fides. Uh, so it was against his, his instinct, I think. And, it just shows uh, that you know this is probably one of those issues where you're not really going to see a Pakistani politician um, exert any courage. In respect to um, PTI and you know why it didn't uh, perform despite uh, Imran Khan's capacity to bring out the vote, uh, and then the next options that are available for his party. Um, he brought out a certain class of people. So, uh, you know, Al Taf Hussein, who was the leader of the MQM, derided them on Sunday as quote unquote burgers, or in Pakistan they also call them the mummy daddy type. So, it's uh, people who eat, you know, hamburgers, Western style food, and not Pakistani food. So, they're from the, uh, the urbanized upper middle class elite, new money, and all that, those kind of people. Uh, and so, that's why a lot of them, you know, they had capital, they had money to spend, uh, you know, $300 or $1,500 on an international flight to go to Pakistan to vote. Uh, many of them came from, uh, you know, their protest in, in the defense area of uh, Karachi right now. You know, those, that's the elite area of Karachi, and that, those were, are where Imran Khan supporters are localized. So he brought out uh, these sort of apolitical, anti-politics type 
who come from Pakistan's elite, at least in Punjab and in, in Karachi. In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, what he did was he appealed to uh, the local sentiment uh, that is not necessarily anti-war, but wants peace. Uh, so they want an end to this violence that they have been um, on the receiving end disproportionately since 2001. And so he is leveraging that sentiment. He's leveraging the, he leveraged the anti-incumbent uh, sentiment as well. And he built uh, an, uh, you know, a solid on-the-ground machine in KP as well. So um, he had this, uh, this group called the Tabdili Razakars, the sort of the um, workers for change. And they went door to door campaigning in the months and we weeks and months before the election. And they are, you know, um, responsible for his party's strong showing. And so they had an infrastructure that was developed uh, probably about a year or two ago uh, in the province. And so that's why they were able to take advantage of the sort of swing vote tendencies in that province. In Punjab, people decided for the steady hand, the experienced hand, who would deal with load shedding, the economy, bread and butter issues that were their primary concerns. Uh, terrorism is not their number one issue because Punjab has... Uh, not really been on the receiving end in comparison to uh, other provinces. And so uh, that's why they, they decided in, in Nawaz's favor. And Nawaz has um, had the advantage of governing the province for five years. They had the Metro Bus Project. Um, they gave out free laptops in response to Imran Khan's um, reach out, outreach to the youth. And it was actually phenomenal to see how, uh, you know, we tend to underestimate, we look at the electoral figures and we, you know, a lot of people dismiss Imran Khan's performance and say, you know, it wasn't a clean sweep. But he really got into Nawaz Sharif's head. Um, he, um, if you look at his Nawaz Sharif's speech in, um, in Sargodha, he was, he was literally talking about Imran Khan the whole time. Uh, he was saying that, I'm the one who's going to bring change. Oh, look at how many youth are here. Um, uh, that guy, can, the, somebody claims that he's the leader of the youth. Uh, look at how most of the people here are young. And then he even started talking about women. He said, oh, look, the women are there, you know? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, you know, it's just an in indication of how he had to adjust politically uh, to, um, to kick Imran Khan out of that space because Imran Khan was really giving him uh, a run for his money in Punjab. So, um, you know, that performance gives Imran Khan and the, his, their control over one province gives them that capacity uh, to um, maybe not really serve as a government in waiting, but to be there on the sidelines in case, in case Nawaz Sharif fails. Uh, but the challenge for Khan is to maintain that enthusiasm uh, among his youthful support, uh, support group. And, you know, as young people tend to... Um, you know, be a bit, you know, lack a little bit focus, and you know, these are sort of, you know, when they're young, they change after five years, and their political they sentiments to, they change. They tend to get old. Yeah, they tend to get old. Uh, you know, and I'm talking too much, and everybody, we're all getting older too. So as we speak, but um, uh, but so you know, he he'll have these challenges in terms of maintaining that infrastructure, building upon it, as opposed to losing it uh, the day after the polls. Um, and you know, it's a very inventive party. They use uh, crowdsourcing. There's a, a huge sense of volunteerism that comes from their network inside the urban areas of Pakistan as well as abroad. And so, um, I, you know, I think he will have to, you know, develop a new narrative uh, to, to maintain this support. And was there any more? I think that was it. Yeah. Is Muid back with us? Uh, Muid, did you want, I don't know if you heard any of the questions, yes. but um, you're welcome to provide an answer, even if you didn't. Do I have anything to add? I actually didn't hear the questions. Okay. Uh, well, why don't, why don't we go to so, some more questions and come back? I mean, I just wanted to make one point. On, again, I had the exact same question. If Imran's mobilized all the voters, then why didn't he do better? Um, I think um, he did remarkably well by traditional standards, the fact that a, a third force emerged and did as well as he did. Um, I think, to me, that's what was new about this election. In some ways, I think what um, Nawaz Shri's performance represents what's still the same, uh, which is in a patronage-based system, why waste your vote on a, on, on a loser? Um, you want to vote for the winner. And that's certainly what you know, I found in my research, that the number one determinant of voter behavior in the Punjab was the perception of who's going to win, because you want to vote for the winner. Um, and I think that also potentially addresses your question on the Islamic parties, which have never done well in electoral politics, and so that always leads to the conclusion that they're not popular. 
Well, they might not be popular, but I don't think electoral politics is a good way to test popularity in the Pakistani context, because if you look at someone like Liaquat Baluch, who is the number two of Jamaat Islami, um, in, uh, ran in Lahore in 1988, I think, and won maybe seven, 8,000 votes, um, and obviously didn't win. In 1990, under the, the sort of ISI helped create the coalition, the IJI coalition, Liaquat Baluch also got that constituency, and he got close to 90,000 votes. So people are happy to vote for Jamaat Islami, the number two of Jamaat Islami, when he l was perceived to be winning, but not when he was uh, perceived to be losing. So I think that, that um, again, are they popular? I don't know. JUI does win seats when because they're perceived to be winning in some of the frontier provinces. But I think it's not a good judge of popularity, electoral politics, necessarily in Pakistan. We have time for uh, two very quick questions, and then we'll come back to some very quick answers uh, right here and then in the back. Thank you. I'm John McCormick with the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. And I'd like to come back to Amendment 18. And given the fact that a, a near majority uh, for the uh, Prime Minister was delivered uh, from Punjab, the appropriations process uh, for the remaining almost 100 million people who are not represented by the PMNO, um, can you give me best case or worst case how these other provinces are going to fare in the um, appropriations? And also, will the Prime Minister uh, continue to support the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline? Um, Wes Salim from Dunya News, Pakistan. Muik spoke about foreign policy, and uh, it largely is a federal subject. But uh, could there be a little different in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where Imran Khan's party is going to make government and they have been the harshest critics of uh, America's drone policy and the war next door, uh, particularly in the next year and a half when uh, all the supplies will be going in and uh, coming out of that corridor. Uh, and as you uh, are have said that uh, this rhetoric resonated with the voters in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So could this force a rethink in this town as well as both parties uh, try to negotiate the rules of the game in the near future. Okay, Muid, did you hear either of those questions? Could you just, could you repeat the first question? I got I got the last one, but the first the first one. one was around the 18th Amendment and how will a party that primarily represents the Punjab um, uh, rep protect the interests or or how will appropriations to the provinces take place when we have a Punjabi dominant central government? Um, I think was it the question, okay. and then also a quick question. Okay. On, yeah, that. Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I, I don't think that that's the correct reading of of the situation. Um, the the appropriations to the to the provinces, the NFC award, the Financial Commission award, already delineates how much money the provinces are going to get for the most part. Uh, so there's no problem of appropriations for the provinces. And precisely because of the 18th Amendment, a number of the issues have to be dealt with at the provincial level now, which forces Nawaz to work with all provinces, including Imran in the KPK and. Uh, PPP in SIN. So I think this is, that's why I said I think it's a good result. You've got a heavy mandate at the center, but there's no way for Nawaz to get around without working with two of his main opponents, the PPP and PTI. So, so I think that's fairly well set up. Um, on your question um, about the drones and sort of KPK, you know, one thing is Imran truly believes um, in this business of, you know, drones being a major problem and Pakistan being involved in America as well. I don't think that was uh, an elect election gimmick. I think he truly believes that. Um, the difference is that drones are being operated in FATA, and FATA is still managed by Islamabad. So unless you see a restructuring of the provinces, I think it's essentially going to be Islamabad who decides what happens with it. Yes, there's going to be a problem because, of course, there's spillover Imran has talked about talking to the Pakistani Taliban, but so has Nawaz. So, you know, I, I, I envision some attempts to talk to the TTP. I don't think they will succeed. But as far as, as the drones are concerned, um, you know, with KPK and the Imran, it doesn't change anything. The drones are flying in part, and that's going to be managed um, by the center. 
I'll add just one other thing, um, Andrew. I think I, I deciphered a question from your answer. Um, interestingly, it's a very confusing result because Imran's success in Punjab, at least the seats that he's picked up, 90% of the people who won are the electables. That's traditional politics. They just joined, happened to be in his party. So he's picked very few seats where unknown candidates have won. In KPK, virtually all of his provincial assembly seats have been won by unpredictable or unknown candidates. So, you know, it's a very confusing result in that sense, and I think it will take time uh, to figure this out. But I can also tell you that Imran has a real struggle on his hands, because in KPK, there is already a forward bloc uh, pitching to Nawaz um, to form a government and bail back him instead of Imran. So he's got to get into this local politics business very quickly and figure out how to keep his, his people to himself. Uh, thank you. Sophia? Yeah, I'll just touch really quickly on the counterterrorism question and the Iran-Pakistan pipeline question. Um, you know, we've expressed our concerns on the Iran-Pakistan pipeline with the previous government, and once the new government is formed, um, we will express those concerns to the new government a as well. So I think um, that's something that, that will be an issue that will be discussed. On the counterterrorism question, you know, the U.S. and Pakistan continue to share sort of a strategic interest in addressing um, extremism and the counterterrorism issue in Pakistan. And I think, um, you know, we'll work with the new government on, on this issue as we have with the previous government. And thus far, Nawaz is sort of um, has indicated that he wants to work with us on this issue as well as a range of other bilateral issues. On respect to the Iran-Pakistan pipeline, uh, Nawaz Sharif's party never mentioned the pipeline in their manifesto. They avoided the issue during the election season. Uh, during the negotiation process, they did try to pressure the, the PPP to uh, make a, a decision in favor of it, but uh, that's because the PPP was in power. Uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif's party, uh, Nawaz Sharif himself, is relatively close to the Saudis. They give him exile. So um, I think you know, those issues might factor in, and his desire not to really rock the boat with the US, I think he's going to kind of try to play it safe and, and kick the can down the road. He might make some. Uh, rhetorical commitments to it, but um, I, I, you know, he has to deal with other related issues like the insurgency in Balochistan, which are which is also interconnected. And just one quick comment: you had uh, made your um, you had a question about the religious parties, um, and it doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it's uh, sort of related. Um, you know, the JUIF party, uh, Maulana Fazl Rahman's party, um, has actually tried to reframe itself as a party, and to some extent, of uh, the, the lower middle class in the KP province. And so um, he had talked about, he, much of his rhetoric was against the military, against the sort of ruling elite, and he had talked about bread and butter issues. He did sort of revert back to the traditional, um, you know, religious chauvinism with the anti-amity thing and, and some of the other aspects. But I think it's an indication that he uh, realizes that the economy is the number one issue, and at least for uh, the interim, he has to pivot and, and, and frame himself as somebody who can uh, govern, um, you know, the right, go govern well and, and also, um, you know, deliver material benefits to people. And one interesting uh, aspect of that pivot is that he's brought in somebody uh, by the name of John Achakzai. I haven't heard of him. I don't know who he is, but um, it seems like he was a journalist with uh, BBC in, uh, in London, and this person is his... A uh, new media advisor. He's tried to write, um, you know, op-eds for Pakistani or Urdu language dailies, and none of it. Uh, it's not really religious language in, in, in the text. Uh, he talks about how, um, you know, there's a difference between uh, identity as a, a re religious identity and national identity, and that Islam calls for the protection of all, um, irrespective of religious background. So there is this type of shift that, you know, at least one political, religious political party is trying to make, and you know, it's an indication of where. Pakistani politics, at least electoral politics, is, is changing. As Andrew had indicated, um, in terms of uh, the, the influence of religious forces inside the country, it doesn't just happen through electoral politics. Uh, it happens as much uh, indirectly uh, and through intimidation and, and also, you know, some sort of positive influence, but non-electoral. Uh, non I'm afraid we ran out of time, but I'd like to thank all of you for coming and if you join me in thanking our panelists. And Moeed, thanks for staying up so late. Yeah. Or is it just dinner time in Lahore? Yeah, exactly. <laughs>